And so if you can see on the screen, you can see Rev Ruling 77137. This is one of the most interesting Rev Rulings, not that you think many of them would be interesting, but this is one of the most interesting Rev Rulings you will ever see. And what it says is really simple. If a creditor has a charging order on an entity like this, an LLC or an FLP, if that entity creates income, guess who gets the K-1 for the income? The creditor. Now, what happens if you didn't distribute the income at, at the end of the year to the creditor? What do they get? They still get the K-1. What didn't they get? They didn't get the money. You know what I call that? I call that phantom income. It's a wonderful thing if you're sitting on the right side of the fence. Now, how long do you think a creditor is going to keep a charging order on an LLC where they didn't get the money, but they did get the income tax bill at the end of the year? I would submit to you not very long. And further, I would submit to you that no attorney in the right mind is going to get a charging order if they know that this is going to happen because when the next lawsuit comes down, it's going to be against the attorney who recommended the charging order and the damages are going to be whatever the client had to pay for the tax bill. This is the power of using an LLC or FLP domestically. Now, if you can look at the schematic again, what are you going to put inside this LLC or this FLP? Let's say you've got a half a million dollar, a quarter million dollar brokerage account. Well, normally, how do you own that brokerage account? You own it in your own name or you may own it in a revocable living trust. That is not protected. Once you put it in an LLC, it now becomes asset protected and you get to avail yourself of this charging order protection. What if you have valuable real estate? You want it inside the LLC. Now, what if you have valuable real estate and a brokerage account? Do you want to put them together? And the answer is no, you don't because there's liability with the real estate. There's no liability with the cash, if you will, in your brokerage account. So you don't want to intermingle those. You'll need two separate LLCs, one for the real estate and one for the brokerage account. And so I don't want to make things overly simplistic, but there's nothing inherently difficult about what I've talked about and about domestic asset protection using LLCs. What do you own? Brokerage accounts, real estate, etc. How do you own it? Well, I currently own it in my own name. How should you own it? Well, if you want to do domestic asset protection planning, you should have it owned inside an LLC, set up in the correct jurisdiction, which has the charging order language as the sole remedy, and it should be a multi-member entity. That's how you should do basic asset protection in a domestic manner. Now, the main question I get is, where should you be setting up these LLCs? Where should you incorporate them? Well, it depends. It depends on your preference. There are a lot of very bright asset protection attorneys out there. They, they all have their preference. But you want to make sure that when you f uh, set up your LLC, it's in a state, again, that has that magic language. The charging order is the sole remedy. If that's not in the statute, if you can't read that in the statute, you're not setting up your LLC in the correct state. Uh, what are some good ones? Typically speaking, Alaska, Arizona, Nevada, Wyoming. There's a handful of them out there. Again, when you work with a good uh, asset protection attorney, they'll be able to guide you into the one that you should be, uh, be using. And again, going to the next slide, I've already stated this, multi-member entities. Stay away from single-member LLCs. There will be uh, asset protection gurus who will pitch single-member LLCs. I don't recommend them. There's a Colorado court case out there that says single-member LLCs are a legal fiction, therefore they will provide no asset protection. No reputable asset protection attorney will use a single-member LLC as a standalone asset protection tool. Now you could use them in conjunction with other asset protection planning techniques, but as a standalone you don't want to do that. And you want it, again, to be a multi-member entity. What does that mean? That means it shouldn't just be you owning it. So 5%, 1%, 3%, it depends on who you ask. Uh, I typically like to recommend 5%, although there's no bright line, there's no court case or no law that says it needs to be one or five. And who should be this other uh, uh, owner in the LLC or the FLP? It can be a family member, it can be a spouse even. A lot of people think that disqualifies it, it doesn't. A spouse is a separate owner. But a lot of times we're gonna recommend an irrevocable trust to be the other member. So make sure it's a multi-member um, LLC or FLP. Now, equally as important as understanding how to do good asset protection planning, we want to make sure that we understand asset protection plannings that do not work. And one of the main ones you want to avoid are what are called joint tenancies. So tenants in common, but joint tenancy, many times you'll hear joint tenancy with rights of survivor. This is one you want to avoid. Unfortunately, it's the most common tenancy that we have out there. It typically is a way to own property a lot of times you'll own property joint tenants with rights to survivor with a, a senior person, maybe a, a, a mother, a father, or a grandfather, or whatever. It sounds really great. Uh, if that person happens to die first, the property will flip to you. It's, a, it's an okay estate planning technique, although I don't typically recommend it. But from an asset protection standpoint, it provides 
no barrier. It's like you own it individually, and not only do you own it individually, you have the liability of the other joint owner. So if they do something wrong, it affects the property. So avoid joint tenancies. Other things you want to avoid, putting assets in your spouse's name. This is a classic one, especially for physicians. Well, I did a really great asset protection plan the other day. I'm the one with all the liability because I'm a surgeon, right? My wife or my spouse is a homemaker or a teacher or whatever. He or she has very little liability, therefore I put all of the assets in that person's name. That is terrible asset protection planning. That spouse, first of all, could divorce you and you could have lots of issues with that person doing things with those assets you don't want because it's in their name. The other problem is, what if that person has a car accident, is texting on their phone, has a drunk driving, whatever it may be. That is not a good asset protection plan and I do not recommend, uh, do not recommend it. One other thing you definitely want to avoid are land trusts. Land trusts, in my opinion, are a quasi-scam. Uh, there are potential reasons to use them, although they're very slight. But if you have somebody pitch you a land trust as a way to own property because your name's not on it, and therefore when people do a property search, they're not going to find the asset, it doesn't work. Remember when I said earlier in the presentation, when you sit down to list your assets in court, at the bottom it's going to be this really special place. It's going to be a special place for assets you've put into a land trust. And so land trusts do not work for asset protection. Even though it's a trust, it is a revocable trust and provides no asset protection. And again, I've already talked about single member LLCs. You want to avoid those. And very briefly, I want to talk about domestic asset protection trusts. They're also called Nevada Asset Protection Trusts or Alaskan Asset Protection Trusts. These are trusts that while on paper and in theory, they sound good. I'm going to set up an asset protection trust domestically for the benefit of me that's going to somehow magically protect all of my assets. And it's effectively a revocable trust, meaning you can go in there and get your money. Typically in the real world, if you can go in and get your money, so can a creditor, except for certain states have come out with these statutes that say that's not the case. Even though you're the beneficiary, you can go in there and get your money. Somehow that's going to protect your money from all creditors. It's protected. Now the problem with these is that they've never been tested. And eventually they will be tested and it will be tested with a very bad fact pattern. So if I used a Nevada Asset Protection Trust and I live in Michigan and I caused harm in Illinois, do you think an Illinois judge is going to respect the laws of the state of Nevada when some child in their state was harmed? There's a, several different questions that I won't get into in this video, but the bottom line is domestic asset protection trusts have not been tested and I don't recommend techniques that have not been tested. So if you're getting people that pitch you these, well, I hope they're giving you full disclosure. My guess is they are not and you need to be wary of them and try to avoid them. Now, why aren't your assets protected? I could give you a very long list and on this slide instead I just put a picture of my book Bad Advisors, how to identify them, how to avoid them. Unfortunately, advisors of all kinds are not taught asset protection. Attorneys are not taught asset protection in law schools. CPAs are not taught that. Financial planners, etc. Very few people know this subject matter even though as now if you've seen the presentation you know this isn't a difficult subject matter. So the bottom line is that very few advisors understand this. And it's imperative upon you to find one that does. And so this is uh, one of the final slides and one of my favorite slides um, and, a, and a picture I took out of a book that I, I really think should hit home with you. There's only, one reach, oh, there's only one way to reach your goal of asset protection, which is what? You need to move yourself up this thermometer from I don't know how, if I only could, if I could, I believe I can, I can, I will, and I did. So my goal with this video is to motivate you to learn more about asset protection planning so that at the end of the day you can move yourself up this thermometer to, to say to yourself, I did it. I am now asset protected and I feel comfortable that if I have a liability problem that my very valuable assets will be protected from those creditors. Now if you'd like more information on asset protection, uh, you, again, you, hopefully you can go to your locally trusted advisor. If you're viewing this on a particular website, the chances are that the person who's got this video on their website knows something about asset protection. If not, you can feel free to contact me and I'd be happy to find you an advisor in your local area who can help you.